Judd, could you paste the, um, the Etherpad link into the chat? Yes, sir. Um, Thank you, sir. And then, for, for the record of, uh, um, again, this is the Dell Open Crowbar planning call from February the 6th, 2014. Um, right now, we don't have any um, external folks on the line. We're all Dellers. Um, so I figured we'd do a quick review of uh, the sprint stories that we've been working <laughs> on and what we're planning on doing, and then uh, discuss um, what's uh, wonderfully appearing on our agenda. Um, so, uh, to kick things off, um, I'll head over to Jira, although we're not supposed to, so it's not a public resource yet, and indicate some of the things that we're working on um, just for completion. For completion. Um, in the previous sprints, we've been um, on some more issues. Um, We've been working on using the Crowbar 2 code um, to create and update um, attributes. Um, Dave Patterson gave a really good presentation on our sprint review, and we should document it um, and get it out there on how to um, add attributes to bar clamps um, and reviewed um, how uh, attribute, um, what's it called, syntax checking. Um, it's not just syntax checking. What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, validation. Validation. Thank you. Um, validation in our current structure is uh, we try to keep it in the model, but there are plenty of situations when attribute validation actually has to happen on the client. Um, and uh, hopefully Rails 4 will be helping us address this, and other features will be helping us address this. Uh, Chris Dearborn put a um, very much to my interest, um, uh, preliminary Burke shell support into Open Crowbar, and uh, I really liked what I saw, um, and uh, it, it seemed really reasonable. Um, we're going to I'm going to be picking that up this sprint. Um, Chris, what else were you working on? Um, yeah, so I just wanted to clarify that that work is in the uh, uh, old Crowbar repositories, not in the open Crowbar repositories, because we haven't switched over yet to open Crowbar. Um, the other thing I just finished up was uh, I'm working, I did some work on the um, upstream OpenStack Chef cookbooks to add in the ability to specify the IP address to bind a service to instead of um, what the cookbooks currently do, which is to look up the IP address based upon an interface name. <clears throat> so I've, I've submitted some changes to upstream um, to allow that. And they haven't been reviewed yet, but uh, they're not critical for the Havana release for those cookbooks. So they're kind of on the back burner right now, but hopefully we can get those reviewed and, and uh, get, the, get those changes in relatively soon. Cool. Thanks. Yep. Um, the um, Virginia, who's not on the call, was um, deeply involved in managing schema and creating databases uh, for uh, within the database bar clamp. Um, and. Um, is there anything else from, say, our Crowbar team um, that we've been addressing? Oh, and, and Wayne did tons of work on the IPMI and BMC bar clamps and, and features, and that's moving along at a good pace. There's a 
in all these things, there's been a lot of learning that's had to happen. Um, but uh, as with any new software, that's really to be expected. Is there anything else before we talk about what uh, we're considering what uh, we'll be committing to for the next sprint? No, I think that's a good good status update. Cool. Um, so for me, um, I was away from most of last sprint and could just touch things really lightly this past week. Um, but I'll um, this coming week I'll be tearing apart um, what we've got so far in Bergshelf 3. Um, it's going to give us a lot of um, uh, some really important new features to Bergshelf. Um, and it's also now under the protective care of Chef Incorporated. They've got a couple developers dedicated to it full time. Um, and they'll be shipping it with their client and server product. Um, so I'll be spending a lot of time with that this upcoming sprint. Um, and I'll also be writing a better design for Docker workload nodes. It had occurred to me that Docker workload nodes, um, as I tried to implement them before I left on vacation, um, were so different from typical workload virtual machines that we were going to have to create um, a mode or a series of tags within Crowbar to indicate which core bar clamps would actually be addressable to uh, to a container. Um, and then once a container is running, how we control a container has several options. Um, the typical SSH in either run scripts or run uh, chef recipes um, doesn't really fit so well with the container model because the container model, um, you can also, you have the option of setting up SSH, but you can also uh, attached to it through standard input and standard output as it's just a process on the core system. Um, and you don't want to be running a lot of services within the container other than the, the service the container is meant for. So it takes a little re-figuring out how we would go about deploying typical workloads. Uh, so those are the two things I'm committing to for this upcoming sprint. Um, unless everything changes during our internal cell sprint planning. Any other folks want to mention what they're planning on getting up to um, so we could maybe even help each other out? Um, I, I can tell you I'm planning on spending some time on the documentation in the area of the uh, Crowbar Developers Guide <clears throat> based on the work that John, John just did a pretty good uh, reorg, and I'm going to be following up with that and fleshing things out. I'm expecting that to be primarily documentation work. There may be a couple of code changes in there, but it'll be mostly documentation. Cool. On the OpenStack side, um, so I'm planning on wrapping up that preliminary Docker support over the next day or two. Uh, and getting that put to bed. So hopefully that will be done for the start of the next sprint. And uh, upcoming sprint, um, I think on the OpenStack team, we've, we've pretty well gotten nailed down the um, uh, messaging, database, OpenStack, bar clamps. I think there's a little bit of work left to do on the Keystone bar clamp. Um, so Regina will probably be working on that. And uh, we'll probably start the next bar clamp, which I believe will be Glance. Um, so I think that's what we're looking looking to do on the OpenStack side. <coughs> cool. Is someone taking notes of that? Oh, John, I put you up to it. Uh, yeah, I got distracted momentarily. My apologies. Um, Um, well, at least it's in the audio recording. Um, should we perhaps move on to our to our bonus round? Um, actually, before our bonus round, um, the um, discussing the, the renaming core. 
Um, I'll pull up the email that I sent with a couple of the possibilities. Um, everybody wants to see that I like to read slash dot. Um, all right. Hey. Um, oh. Okay. Um, Arcadi adds uh, some consistency in naming docs, but uh, so the situation had been that you know I've got my GitHub account name is New Goliath, and that when I um, fork the repo to be able to do my own um, pull requests back into the Open Crowbar repo, um, I end up with products just named Core don't really mean much when you're looking at it next to um, um, lots of other projects like um, like Jeff and uh, um, Bookshelf. See here. Um, you can pretty much tell um, what project is coming from. You know, when we said bar clamp, at least we knew it was uh, Crowbar. The Burke Shelf guys tend to, you know, Burke Shelf, um, Chef guys, prefix with Chef. The um, pipe work was an outside project, and that's been brought into Docker. Um, User D is just its own project. Um, so, you know, a Nova repo might be better called OpenStack Nova. Um, so what, do, what do folks think about uh, um, about calling it, um, say, Open Crowbar Crowbar Core? Could you paste what the current proposal is into the uh, sync-in, EFAD? On its way. Thank you, sir. Might Rob also thought instead of sledgehammer, it would be um, discovery agent or discoverer. Thank you so much. Just discovery. It was.
Yeah, that looks good to me. Yeah, right. It just seems like... The, the downside of doing this is our package names are going to become humongously long, which is quite out of character for Linux. It means that our package name is going to be open crowbar dash crowbar dash open stack dash docs dash two dot o dot o dash big number dash version number dot noah hmm? dot rpm that's going to blow a lot of systems up in my opinion it's the oh. name there john are we talking about repo names or are we talking about package names? package package names okay. currently our our semantic is to use the open crowbar moniker ahead of the repo name as the package name the yeah, intent is to package one repo per RPM. I understand. So that means you know, just thinking out loud here, I mean uh it it may not make sense for us to have the package names mirror the mirror the top level repository. I mean it could be open crowbar core, open crowbar docs for package name but it would be silly to call it open crowbar slash crowbar core in the package. Because the yeah. thing is, when you look at the repo, the repo name, since we're using GitHub, the repository name is arbitrary. We're calling it open crowbar, but you can rename it to anything you want locally or when you make a personal, personal clone. So it's just, it's a placeholder. The important names are the names of the actual repos. They can also be changed, but the top level org name Hub is just there as a locator, so I'm not <laughs> sure that the packages should pick that up. They do need to have some sort of prefix, but I think Open Crowbar would be fine. Someone's picking up. I have no noise. Idea. I have no idea. I don't hey, this is Victor. Yes, Victor. Excellent. So, Rod asked me to call in on this. Um, if we're going to rename the repo, the person gets tasked to do that, gets to fix all the stuff that will break in our current dev processes. I would. Personally. Can you elaborate? Well, I've kind of been writing all this code that does things like sets up uh, Docker admin nodes and other such fun things and bootstrapping admin nodes and all that other fun stuff. And it kind of relies on the current uh, repository layout that we currently have. On the layout or the names? The names are part of the layout. We can change. Just means a bit more effort. Yes. Nothing is cast in concrete, but the trouble is when you've started to put the building up, Changing the shape of the concrete often means destruction of the building or partial in so, <laughs> let's let's look at from slightly a different angle if uh, we want other people working with us on various components let's say we work with i don't know take uh, HP to work with us on their hardware or uh, self uh, creating uh, another workload or somebody else doing other thing. What is uh, uh, a recommendation of how they would uh, create new repos or how they will contribute to the current repos? This all just came up because when I forked the repos, I just had something in mind just called core. 
and core could sort of be anything, and I was concerned about collisions for people who were contributing. Um, the way yeah. they're going to contribute is the typical way that everybody contributes to every other open source project on GitHub. Um, so uh, I understand Victor's, you know, hesitance to, to rename. Um, yeah. From my perspective, I mean, from my perspective, I you know you have the org name and you have the repositories in the org name. Um, you made a good point, which is when somebody forks what's currently called core, they end up with a repo called core in their GitHub organization or locally, and the context may be lost. <clears throat> I wouldn't mind us. There's no reason that your personal fork has to have the same name as uh, the stuff in Open Chrome. Yeah, that's right. That's no, right. it doesn't. It doesn't. Um, and the only one that I considered, uh, the only one I thought might need to be renamed was Core, but I was fairly happy with the current organization. Um, I mean, my preference would have been to call Core kind of crowbar. Um, or OCV. Or OCV okay. Core. Too short. I, I'm, not, I, I'm not much into the shorty names for the repo myself. Um, I, I mean, it's an acronym, so it may not be obvious. I thought we could rename Core to Crowbar. The remaining repositories I didn't have a problem with. Um, I do question whether we want to continue the model of having the RPMs named the same as the repos, um, simply because I, I think in the future, the, pa the packaging and repos really shouldn't reflect the source code organization. Or at least we shouldn't commit to that. It's likely to merge short term, but I wouldn't want to commit to that. So the thinking behind that, um, Mike, was that what we want to do is install one package for Crowbar mm -hmm. and one package one package per workload. I agree. I I think the RPM packaging is correct. I I'm just raising the point that I don't think the RPM packaging um, should commit to always tracking the organization of the source code. That's all. So I, I don't think the naming the, the naming issue we mentioned, where the packages are based on the uh, repos, um, yeah, we, I don't think we should we, maintain that link. But I like your RPM packaging, one per workload. For example, there would be a core Crowbar RPM. There might be a Crowbar Hardware API RPM. There would be a Crowbar OpenStack RPM. You know, to me that makes sense. Crowbar Hadoop RPM. I just don't think we should commit forever that those RPMs reflect the actual organization of the code, because it may change. There are about 15,000 foundation uh, source code packages that make up the Linux distribution spectrum. And the general pattern for better than 95% of those is that the package name follows the name of the um, uh, of the source code? Well, it follows the name and of the project, but they're not yeah. all on GitHub, so they're not tied to particular repo names. Um, I guess I'm in a nitpick mode, though. Um, I, all, all I'm really saying is I, that I I like the concept of the packaging. I don't think we should kind of codify that the package names will be permanently yanked from these particular repository names, but I think mirroring them makes sense right now. Um, um, I have no uh, no personal attachment to how the naming yeah. is done. Um, as far as I'm concerned, anyone can change whatever is there. It's an open project. Yeah. Uh, so the, the key question really is, what do we gain by changing? Other than a little bit of namespace uh, wonkiness, what are we? Who are we appealing to? Who is our target, and what's the win by yeah. changing at this point? Yeah, so I'll, I'll come down and say that I I don't think it makes sense to pro prefix every repo with crowbar dash whatever when they're already organized under a single GitHub organization. The only name that I thought might be subject to discussion would be the core which I thought made more sense to be called Crowbar, but I have no strong preferences. I just thought it might be a little less confusing to call it Crowbar. But I, I'd hate to go in and prefix everything with Crowbar-whatever. 
That's what namespaces are for. Well, if you look at the share right now, the the Berkshelf guys, for example, um, prefix their API server with Berkshelf. So the, the organization is Berkshelf, and the product is Berkshelf, and then um, everything is either prefixed or suffixed with Berkshelf except solve. <laughs> and I, I love the prefixed or suffixed. It's like, okay, let's have a convention. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it, depends, it depends on the, the process. It depends on the, the goal, the, the, the use of that particular repo, right? So Vagrant Berkshelf, it usually just gets Vagrant comes first, you know, because it's a, it's a yeah. Vagrant plug. So, um, and Solve is a, is a solve is sort of um, it's a side project of the Berkshelf people, um, but it's not applicable only to Berkshelf, you know. But our our uh, all of our Crowbar stuff is applicable only to Crowbar. Um, I considered something like you know Sledgehammer, which you know could potentially not be only used with Crowbar, but the likelihood of that happening is very slim. Um, so it's fine to call it Crowbar, and it maybe eventually we'll have something within any of our repos that are not project specifically designed for use with Crowbar. Yeah. Um, so so that, that's the argument for prefixing everything. Um, and I do with Rob's big negative too about splitting out docs. Um, yeah, we're docs splitting out docs makes no sense because docs are already versioned in the core repo. So crowbar right. docs are part of it. So I mean, I'll put a minus one thousand there. I don't want to split out docs because docs, by definition, the docs that are related to the code, the developer level stuff, are tied to the specific bar lab. So we don't need a separate repo for it. Okay, I only um, introduce docs because there are a lot of systems that make it very easy to point to. A Specific docs repo in order to publish out to a website or a wiki or to you know some other yeah. publishing. But we already made the decision that we weren't doing that. That's the problem. Okay. And I mean, I, I it's not so much I have a strong opinion one way or the other. It's just we embedded the docs into the code with a code generation system. So to split them out now would be a huge effort in terms of the doc generation code and stuff. Uh, I do think we're still going to pull the docs out of those repos and publish them to a website someplace. Um, as for the renaming, you know, I, I don't have a strong opinion one way or the other, uh, but I would prefer that we resolve it and get it done because there are a lot of scripts and tools that are picking up these various names, and I don't want to go through another great renaming in a couple of months. Um, okay. Victor, you had some you had some points related to stuff be, to the naming of stuff. Sorry, I thought Vic, Victor had a couple of points about why he thought we shouldn't be renaming. You know, I'm kind of um, I'm fifty fifty. I hate I've already that. written some significant chunks of code that rely on the current naming scheme. Yeah, and so have I. So, <laughs> and know. if we do rename, then some schmuck who isn't me gets to fix it all up. <laughs> so then, Victor, as as your load would be the heaviest in this change, I think we should leave <laughs> up to you. I, I think Victor indicated that the schmuck was not going to be him. <laughs> Um. Anyhow, yeah, and that's my concern about the renaming too. It's my only real concern is we we do have stuff that reference these repos at various levels. So if we're doing anything, um, it, it's going to have an, a, an impact, and it it's going to ripple down at some stage. Wait, all this stuff in your code isn't parameterized. <laughs> <laughs> Parameterization means that you have to supply a crap ton of arguments that I really would prefer you don't have to supply or that the code can just figure out on its own. Yeah, I'm just teasing. 
Um, so we're saying if, if I really want this to happen, I've got to fix the code once I break the repo. <laughs> All right. Yep. Yeah, and also since this one is since this one impacts quite 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 a few of us, we we need to actually schedule the update if we're doing it and decide when we're doing it, when it's happening, and just make it happen. And as I just said, I I'm not that concerned. I got bigger fish to fry short term. All right, so uh, I'm kind of hearing that this wonderful conversation, as enlightening as it's been, um, will now the motion is is uh, what is it? The motion doesn't carry. The motion fails. <laughs> I think the motion failed. It's motion tabled. Failed. <laughs> well, plus I, I I I do think we'd need a broader discussion on this, which opens up a bigger can of worms. Well, guys, just to be clear, before we open it up for public and public start using it, we need to uh, we need to iron that out and close that issue with whatever the final thing will be before we make it public. Yeah. Um, public? This is a public. We're in a public forum right now. Uh, right now, we are not actively soliciting participation. Oh. It is public, and uh, the, the only. The only participants right now are internal to them. Once oh. you open it up right. and actively solicit players, you'll have to make uh, the foundation sturdy. Uh, I, I'm sorry, Arkady, but this is an open project already. The code is out there, and there are a number of people who are already working with the open crowbar code in the community. And I do expect and anticipate contributions, whether we solicit them or not. The, that level of change of the structure of the code of the code base uh, better be done before uh, the number of contributors go way up, and we are working a, a lot mm -hmm. more with uh, contributors uh, and uh, continuous code change. Yeah. So. I'll, I'll weigh in and say right now I think it's an idea. I I don't feel strong enough to say we need to do this right now. Um, I understand the some of the trade offs, um, <clears throat> but you know maybe the right action to take is rather than us making a decision now to spend some time figuring out exactly what the impacts are because I know there's going to be some impacts on me. There are going to be impacts on various uh, continuous integration and QA tool sets, and if we are making a change, we need to understand the impact. That's where I stand, and I don't think I know the impact yet. So I, in, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a try and see what fails during this sprint, and let you all know at the next meeting, at the design meeting next week, um, what happened. What hilarious! You will, if you when you try that, you'll need to make your changes across all the Open Crowbar repos, Judd. No, I wouldn't do it in the Open Crowbar community, in the Open Crowbar organization. I would just do it in yes, my organization. Yes, I understand that, but you'll need to do it across the build tools as well as the core, as well as anything else that's been worked on. Okie doke. Just, I'm not complaining, I'm just giving you a pointer there. Sure, sure. Um. Yeah, no, I just I was just confused. Yeah, I wouldn't be working in the open crowbar repo. I'd be working, you know, uh, in the uh, on GitHub. I'd be working on my own clone. So yeah, that's fine. No, so this subject is dead. The horse is dead. Um, until next time. Oh no, not a dead horse. Uh, more more for the glue mm -hmm. factory. Yeah. Get around to our bonus round of reviewing John Terpster's thrilling documentation reboot. Are you going to walk through that, or shall I, Judd? Please, sir. Can I give How you control? Do I a, yes, if you would. Um. John T. 
I do. All right, you're getting presenter. Well, I already have the thing I present, and it's already running. Why does it want to? Come on. What's happening? Hmm. Try that again, if you would, please, Judd. Trying again. You can also request from me, if you'd like. Oh, uh -huh. and there's Octocats. Yay! Can you see it? I can see it. Yep. What operating system is that? That looks familiar. Yeah, it does. Okay. It's called Vista or something like that. <clears throat> I, everyone seems to have gone rather faint at the moment, but I, I'll press on. Um, <clears throat> when we open up the um, GitHub repo on the um, root of the core repository, it automatically brings up a README file. Uh, the README gives a brief welcome and overview, welcome to and overview of Open Crowbar. This morning, I added. Uh, a facility to um, go directly to the the uh, Docker fast start, and there's the TLDL, a TLDR uh, reference. That's the same thing, and the good oil version of that document is here. So that link works. Stepping back into this uh, front end document, uh, we can go directly to the um, to the um, index here. This index will ultimately be automatically generated. Uh, it is now laid out according to the development guide um, uh, infrastructure. So here is the uh, the how-to on deployment of uh, Open Crowbar RPMs on CentOS 6.5. Gives a detailed overview of our objectives the installation process, preparation, how to go about deploying it, uh, what sort of things need to be covered, and so forth. Back to this document. Um, there is also a new document that documents the project layout. That's the top-level directory stuff, and then the principles and template for directory layout within the project itself. Um, the design concept uh, has, has a link. And all of these documents do, unfortunately, need to be reviewed and updated. Closing that, going back to the next one, uh, the APIs are documented. Uh, here are all of the APIs. I will be updating those with um, Derek's assistance in uh, the next half hour. Um, there is a description of the APIs. So each document, sh each of those directories should have a master markdown document in it that describes the contents of the documents in the directory that it should be the master of. And that should be indexed. Uh, the title that is across the top of the document is what will ultimately become the title that will appear. Right now, it says description of APIs. That will be whatever that top line title is. It is intended that that will become the title uh, that, that will have the link to that top level document. Uh, the directory itself will also containing the documents will also have a link to take people to the directory. That way they can see all the files that are in there. 
the um, descriptive document, the master document in that directory could then have links to individual documents that are important within that uh, directory. Any questions or comments at this point? Um, <clears throat> just Mike here, John, just to point out, uh, in case anybody's confused, the, the code is already in place in Crowbar to generate most of this TLC stuff. I'm aware there are some glitches in it, but they're the code to actually generate these indexes and follow the conventions you described is in place, but I think there's a couple of glitches in it. Right, so but in discussion right. with in discussion with Rob yesterday, it would appear that we may need to update that a bit. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the things I'll be looking at this next sprint. There is a workflow overview document here that still needs uh, some significant surgery. There are blanks to add docs here. If any, if anyone is uh, feels uh, inclined, please, please help add add uh, uh, guidance documentation for the day to day and any release workflows that may be needed. Um, I guess I could step through an awful lot more, but I'm more interested in questions and uh, feedback. It looks good. Basic feedback. It looks good. So I stress again that um, I tried to preserve what looked like the most recent, most complete information. I have in all likelihood trounced on someone's precious work. I apologize for that if that has happened. And I would, I would urge anyone who has been impacted by that to either fix it or get in touch with me and guide me um, so that I can fix it because my intent is not to, uh, to blow away um, effort that has been expended. And that's it from me. Do you need to, do I have to hand back to you, Judd, or how does this work? Well, um, we could move on. If there's, are there any questions? Um, I am really excited to have the hopefully have the time to dig into this and uh, and add a whole lot of docs myself. Um, thank you very much for going through all of that. Um, My pleasure. You can hand back to me. I'm basically gonna. Um, I re I I re <laughs> apologize. Yeah. You are the presenter again. Good. Um, so if, uh, Victor had threatened to show us uh, his latest fig pull request. Um, Victor, if you want to do the, uh, the Skype share thing again, that'd be super cool. Skype share thing. I can do that. We have just 11 minutes left on the call. Um, I have nothing else to cover on my side. I mean, I think it's going to be a busy sprint because we'll be doing uh, quite a bit of work to, to move towards uh, shifting over to this repo. but. So I'm trying to call you, Judd, but you ain't answering. I'm sorry. Um, I don't hear you ringing. Um, Mr. Lauther, video call. Actually, we don't need a video call. Hi. Yeah, don't call me on Skype because I'm... Uh, I'm on, I'm logged in on two places and it's picking my phone. <laughs> there we go. Oh. Okay. I'll mute, mute, mute. And let's go full screen and. 
this window. All right, can folks see that? Okay. Oh, and it just got merged. Yay. Okay. So pretty much what I've been doing for the last three days, uh, Rob put a bug in my ear on um, like Thursday, wondering how hard it would be to um, migrate the core crowbar framework in open crowbar to run on top of Rails 4.0. Uh, so I did that. And The upshot is it allowed some uh, simplification to how we were abusing things in application controller and single table inheritance. And it swapped out uh, the uh, model-based access control uh, with uh, adder accessible and adder protected. And uh, that layer of control has been pushed up to using strong parameters in the controllers. So for instance, um, when you go and create a new object, let me just pick one here. easier to read here. If you could just slide that window over to the middle, that'd be super groovy. Thanks. Is that better? Much. So let's do yeah, something that uh, really... requires a create. So the major change is that when I'm creating a new node, I check that the required parameters for creating a node are passed in as part of the create function in the controller. And then I filter out any parameters that I don't want to, or that I want to ignore on node creation as part of the uh, params.permit. So you blacklist says, parameters on the constructor? Accept all these parameters and uh, throw away anything that isn't that. That way we, we can filter on a pretty fine grain level what goes in and what goes out whenever we are creating or, for instance, just down here, updating a node. Like we can say that you can't update the ID, you can't update um, created at and updated at and those sorts of parameters. You can't update the... Um, well, you can't update what deployment ID you're pointing at, but there are some other attributes that you will not allow to be updated via mass assignment here. And I haven't implemented anything that uses it yet, but with strong parameters, you can actually, um, for instance, if we wanted to, if we wanted to allow updating the um, updating the hence field that the node has or updating the discovery attribute. You can actually construct a parameters permit that knows how to parse in to the JSON that got passed and uh, pick and choose what you will allow from there. So we could only allow updating specific sections of the JSON without having to write a bunch of custom code that does it for that uh, does that for us. So this would get rid of all of the filtering stuff that's done the uh, done right now in the uh, node roles controller, where we got to filter on this prefix and all that. By saying that you can only change these things, we would avoid having to do that kind of filtering, right? Funny, you, Hello? funny you mentioned that. I think you should have mentioned that. Okay. So 
right now, when we create a node role, the only thing we let in is um, we let in the role ID and the node ID because we have to have them. And we will let you pass an initial blob of JSON data into the node role. And right now, I haven't updated, I haven't modified the update because I need to uh, figure out what Rob's intent was with that whole data prefix thing and see how best to subsume it. Um, but I have plans for how to handle updates for things that um, have both a mix of active record attributes and uh, crowbar attributes that uh, map into user data. And handling that would be significantly easier with the uh, param stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's and the params data. We could get rid of that. Well, I can just permit specific parts of it or just not allow you to update it directly, but only update it in the context of an attribute. Right. Like instead of uh, like... This is only Rails 4. This is... Yeah, this is all in Rails 4. Any feature of Rails 4? Uh, faster, better, more secure, more productive, fitter, happier. In a cage on antibiotics. You know, that's the usual upgrade stuff. And um, this is the main thing, though, is that it makes... Um, by moving by moving the... Uh, by moving access controls from the model into the controller, we can have a find a grand level of control. And I've already uh, used that to vastly simplify some of the helper methods, like um, API show and friends. Now, instead of API show taking, you know, a mix of five parameters, some of which can be nil and some of which can't be, API show takes exactly one thing, and that's the object that you want to show. Okay. So this is the end. Oh. So this is the entirety of API show there. It just returns the object plus the content type that uh, we want for the object. I can barely make it out um, because of the way that join me is rendering. But um certainly looks cool from what I can see. Yeah, John needs to precisely the uh, best rendering thing. Okay. Yeah, the downside to migrating to Rails 4 is that there is some manual conversion that has to happen, um, and pretty much all of that involves uh, going into your model, uh, stripping out any uh, any adder protected or adder accessible declarations, and uh, moving that access control into the controller. With uh, so they didn't just de they and didn't and they didn't just deprecate that stuff. That they've actually physically removed it from. In order to get it back, in those calls, they're they're gone. Yeah, they're gone from core Rails. You can get it back via Jim, but I decided just to go ahead and uh, port over all the core stuff so that I could start using it. Okay, so you could do the migration bit by bit, though. If you install this other gem, it will support those methods. You could do the refactor a bit at a time. Yeah. Right. Where do things get interesting in the relationship between active record objects and adder objects?
that's going to be the subject of one of my next series of major pull requests. <laughs> um, but the upshot can is you from an Can you repeat that point, question, please, Judd? Victor, could I not what was that, John? What was the question that Victor was answering? Oh, just where do things get interesting when um, comparing or just get interesting in general when dealing with active record um, objects and attributes versus crowbar attributes and objects? Oh, wonderful. Thanks for the clarification. The upshot and goal for doing a lot of this work is that I want to be able to treat crowbar crowbar attributes the same as just attributes on like a node role or on a node or on a role or on a deployment role so that uh, you can query them via the crowbar so you can query and set them via the crowbar APIs um, the same way that you do for just basic attributes. That way it makes it much easier to programmatically update things like to um, go in and for a specific node set what, to, what OS you want to have installed on it. Um, you don't have to go in, you won't have to go in and parse that JSON. You won't have to go in and parse that JSON and merge it in manually because it'll just be exposed as another attribute on the it, it, it'll be exposed as another attribute via the API, and Crowbar will handle the work of making sure that it's uh, merged properly and validated. Where does Active Record fit in? What do you mean? Or does it actually fit in? Um, it fits in in that uh, in the sense that all the attributes wind up being stored in the blob of JSON that's stored in active record. Okay. But due to kind of the dynamic nature of attributes, it gets a little painful to do the uh, validation at the level of that blob of JSON. So I'm right. going to try to uh, lift it up a level. Gotcha. Um, we are two minutes over time. You managed to waste another perfectly good hour with the uh, um, Open Crowbar team uh, stealing a few lines from uh, uh, All right, I'm dropping oh, out of my next call to go to. Um, thanks, everybody, for showing up. And uh, um, thank you. Get your thank toys you. on next week next week's agenda and uh, I'll be posting converting and posting this video uh to the suite and posting it to the list. Thanks a lot everybody. Really appreciate All right. it. Okay, thank, thank you. Bye -bye.